Good morning. Welcome to worship at Cam and Kirk this morning. I invite you to stand as you're able as the Bible is brought in. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. The uh, intimations are as printed on the sheet this morning. I don't think there's anything particular to emphasise except that everything is getting back into the groove again following the school holidays. Uh, so most organisations and uh, are uh, open in the coming week. We come to worship God and our opening responses will be read by Harley Mendelssohn. <coughs> this is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot put it out. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. We hear the angel words, He is not here, He is risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. We sing together the hymn 430, Christ has risen while earth slumbers.
this is what's known as the third Sunday in Easter. We have a short phase of the church year, which runs between Easter Sunday and Pentecost, which is called the season of Easter. Though, as Christians, every Sunday is part of the season of Easter. But this week, we celebrate the third week of Easter. We come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of life, we approach you in this time only to find you already on the way towards us. God of the living, we come seeking acceptance only to find you waiting already with open arms. God of our lives, we come looking for affection only to find your unrestricted love already welcoming us in. Living God, we come now and meet you here, in friend and stranger, in the familiar and the unknown, in comfort and in dis-ease, glad that you are already and always with us. God of the present way, we confess that we prefer to dwell in the past or we spend time in fruitless worry about the future. We try to undo what has been done, to second guess what will be, instead of simply living in your presence and in your present, loving and being loved, healing and being healed. Help us to accept that we cannot undo what is done, nor foresee what will come. Grant us instead to live in your peace. We give the past to you and rest in your forgiveness. We give the future to you and rest in your love. Through Christ, the resurrection and the life, we pray. Amen. We're thinking today about strangers and friends, how strangers become friends, how friends become strangers perhaps as well. What's that process all about? Strangers and friends. And we'll hear later the reading from the story of the Emmaus Road where the disciples or some disciples met with Jesus as he walked towards Jerusalem and they um, didn't recognize him. Um, we'll be thinking a bit about how it is that we recognize Jesus and who we recognize Jesus in. I want to ask you this morning um, what you think some of the things are that keep us from recognizing the good in other people. What keeps us from sometimes from recognizing, it can be very simple things, that keep, keeps us from recognizing the good in other people? Our own bitterness. Our own bitterness, yes. That, I think that's true. Yeah, that Our own bitterness, we then project it onto other people. We can't see the good in people. What are some of the other things that just listening to me, all you folk from Edinburgh, <laughs> what, what, what puts you off immediately? Come on, be honest. Accents. Accents, yes. One of the big things that puts people off is accents. Um, that, uh, when you hear a, a, a different accent from your own, you think, oh, that's a bit strange. He might be from Glasgow. <laughs> Actually, he's from Motherwell, not Glasgow, which is much posher than Glasgow. <laughs> not. <laughs> yep. Yes. Those are, those are three big things. Different clothes. People dress differently. Now, we see a lot of that, and we've seen some very rude things that some of our politicians have said from time to time 
particularly about Asian women, you know, and having so-called letterbox that they look through, which is a terrible thing to say about somebody's dress. That's the way that they dress. They have a, a reason for dressing in that way. And uh, we, we may not think it's how we want to dress, but it doesn't mean there's something wrong with it, although they, they're not good. That, that was one thing you said, dress, and you said two other things. Different religion, yes, that's a, that's a, a, a growing one now, isn't it? I mean, 30 years ago in Scotland, you would hardly have found anybody who was openly worshipping in another religion. But now it's very common. We see people from a Muslim background or from a Hindu background, from a Jewish background, um, and other religions around the world. We, we encounter people now who come from different religious backgrounds. And it may stop us from seeing the good that's in them because they're not like us. Well, we see difference as a barrier. What are some of the things that help us to recognise the good in others? We can think of things that are barriers, but what are some of the things that help us to recognise good in others? What would help you to see the good in somebody else? Sorry, I missed that. A warm smile, yes. Yes, a welcoming smile. A winning smile, we say sometimes, don't we? That's a phrase we use. A winning smile. Any other things that would help us? I think um, living as both as well other people in different religions and different skin colors. Yeah. If you're a neighbor, um, to keep up the work right with your friends. Yes. Um, like you, you know, friends. Yes. Yes, that's it. When, when we actually meet our neighbours, our people who may look different or sound different, uh, it's actually when we begin to meet them that we understand that that difference is not something that separates, but something that can enrich our lives together. So difference can be a really good thing for us. Okay, well, we're, we're going to keep thinking about the, the recognition of difference and how we um, see that illustrated in the story of Jesus meeting disciples on the way to Emmaus this morning. Now we're going to sing hymn 415. I'm really pleased we're going to get a chance to sing this. This is my favourite Easter hymn and the choir sang it on Easter morning. And I only realised just before uh, we printed the order of service that I'd put it in for the service, so we didn't want to try and compete with the choir, but they know it well and they'll help us as we sing this morning, this joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sorrow. <laughs>
listen now for the word of God. The first reading is taken from the New Testament, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, and reading from verse 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord, Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Amen. The second reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and reading from verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking to each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people 
and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God bless to us the reading and hearing of his holy word, and to his name be all glory and praise. Amen. We sing together again now the hymn 424, Blessed Be the Everlasting God. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in God's sight. Amen. Whichever side of the fence we're on, the political events of recent years around the whole issue of Brexit 
are disturbing for a number of reasons. Not least is the trajectory of the lurch towards the right, which has overtaken many Western democracies in recent years. The excess of fairly extreme right-wing parties in taking us down paths that were unthinkable until very recently is founded on their appeal to the more basic human instincts and especially on our fear of strangers. The notion that we derive no benefit, for example, from the presence of migrant workers, that they are here to take our jobs and our women too, uh, feeds the latent racist in us all and probably the latent sexist too. It is ludicrous. But as a country, we appear at points to have fallen for it. Promoters of such ideas present foreigners, or at least certain kinds of foreigners, as a blight on our nation in terms of increased crime, demands on the health service, taking jobs from the lowest paid, and the most vulnerable members of our own society, all of which are simply untrue. They emphasize the cost of supporting asylum seekers, for example, increases in the cost of border controls, counter-terrorism measures, and by one absurd recent guesstimate, three billion pounds worth of additional crime allegedly per perpetrated by immigrants. That kind of demonization of the stranger is easy political capital for those scaremongers who would have us see our country as being swamped by immigrants. There's even a danger that the church joins in on this bandwagon with scare stories about how other religions, and especially, of course, Islam, are becoming a threat to Britain as a Christian country. How long is it since we were really a Christian country? A long time, I think. It's very easy to find ourselves sucked into that way of thinking, however. So when we're fed the line that these incomers are of no benefit to us, there is a temptation simply to nod with embarrassment and tacitly agree, even although we do not. The whole issue of the value of migrant people should be of concern to us. The leisure and tourist industry would collapse without migrant workers in hotels, catering and bar work. Our harvests would probably remain unpicked. This is not new, though perhaps the proportion of folks from abroad rather than our own young people has changed. There is a little balance, there is little balance in media presentation of the issues with the notion that we do benefit both economically and socially from the presence of others scarcely worthy of news. So there's certainly room for the church to responsibly raise the debate to a level which does not see people as a commodity which either benefits us or does not. We should value people for who they are, our neighbours, rather than what benefit we might accrue from them in the short term. Our gospel story of the Emmaus Road is a tale of travellers and an encounter with the risen Christ. All of us associate certain things with certain stories and this is one story that I associate very particularly um, with an experience I had in the mid-1990s. The um, strong association which I have is with a, a visit to a small group of Christians in a slum area in the center of San Salvador, the capital of El Salvador in Central America. At that time, I was teaching New Testament and Greek at the uh, joint theological colleges in Manchester attached to the university there. And the, the Baptist College in Manchester had a relationship which had developed during the years of the Civil War in El Salvador uh, with the Baptist College in Santa Ana uh, in El Salvador. Throughout that awful time of civil war in the 1980s, the lives of ordinary folks in El Salvador were transformed and not always for the better. 
We had various exchange visits between Manchester and San Salvador, um, and that was to both offer solidarity to friends who were there, and more importantly, to listen and to learn from the experience of people's resistance and courage in the face of attempts to destabilize and effectively rule their country by proxy. This was during the time of Ronald Reagan's presidency in the United States. By the time I visited El Salvador in the mid-90s, the Civil War was officially at least over, and some kind of normality had begun to return, though it was still, from my perspective, a significantly violent and uneasy place to be. Almost everywhere I went, I met and talked with people who still had, right at the forefront of their minds, very recent and powerful memories of atrocities that had taken place. Stories which are wearily familiar to us from different parts of the world. We think only in recent times of Kosovo, South Sudan, Rwanda, Chechnya, and currently in Israel and Palestine. These were stories of the lives and loves of ordinary people like us, for whom the veneer of peace, tranquility, <coughs> and neighborliness had virtually overnight been replaced by violence, death squads, terror, and mistrust. In such a, hugely in such a situation, it is hugely difficult to know whom to trust. Those who have been neighbors and friends can suddenly become informers for the secret police, or the ones who betray us to the death squads. A stray word of criticism can become the basis for attack, the reason for a person to disappear, the pretext on which you're gunned down in broad daylight in the street. And even some three or four years after the establishment of an uneasy peace, such acts of terror were continuing to take place. I remember well spending my first Sunday in El Salvador. It happened to be the Sunday immediately following uh, Easter Sunday. Spending that day at the funeral of a young man whom I'd never met, but had an appointment to meet and visit the next day. He was a member of the Central Baptist Church in San Salvador, and he had been shot dead in the street on his way to work amongst the poor in the shanty town at the centre of San Salvador. He worked with the, amongst the poor, and I was due to visit his, the shanty town ten days later for a Bible study. His critique of the treatment of the poor had reached the wrong ears, influential ears, and he paid with his life. From the comfort of my normal life, in a college in a suburb of Manchester, it was a stark and unforgettable lesson in the cost of discipleship. There were many profound lessons I gained from my five weeks spent on that occasion in El Salvador, but significant amongst them was an evening I spent with a small Bible study group in what I discovered later to be one of the most dangerous slums of the city. Fortunately, my friends told me that only after we'd been there. My friends took me along to meet what they called a basic Christian community group, or a base community as they're known, and to share in their study of the Bible in preparation for Mass the following Sunday. El Salvador is an overwhelmingly uh, Catholic country. About 15 people gathered in a very basic living room of a concrete building with a corrugated iron roof. All ages were present, from a six-year-old child to a widow in her 80s. The priest was also there, but he didn't make himself prominent. Instead, he left space for the local folks to organize the event and to conduct the Bible study. Very few of those 15 folks could actually read. So one of the women who was literate who worked in a local cooperative bakery, read aloud the text for the following Sunday, the Emmaus Road story, as we just heard it. Then quite spontaneously, half a dozen of the group, including the child and the elderly widow, went into the corner of the room and talked for a while about 
uh, the content of the text. Then out of virtually nothing, they acted out their own interpretation of the story. No words, wandering around the room in conversation with themselves and ending by leaving in the centre of the room a number of symbols around which we sat. There was a sandal which represented the journey. There was a candle for light. There was a small bread roll in a basket for the meal that was shared. And then there was the Bible from which the woman had read the story. For about three quarters of an hour, the group discussed together the meaning of the story for their lives, or rather, how their experience of life related to the tale of Jesus' encounter with friends who didn't recognize him on the road to Emmaus. <coughs> the woman from the bakery, Louisa was her name, spoke about her feelings of shame in reading the story because she had not recognized the woman who worked beside her as her neighbor. Louisa had been suspicious of her, part of the breakdown of trust that was a symptomatic part of the Civil War. The woman's son had been on the side of the US-backed militia. The woman was poor, and Louisa had had the opportunity to give her bread and to relieve her circumstances, but she had chosen not to do so. As Louisa had walked with the others, acting out the lack of recognition of Jesus, her eyes had been opened as Jesus broke bread, as he shared the most basic things in life. The essence of community became clear to her. Jesus, who had been killed while all his friends fled and left him alone, had returned to share life and love with those whom he might justifiably have been suspicious. And even then, they failed to recognize him. All that was asked of Louisa, she felt, was to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to share bread as he had done, with those against whom he might have quite justifiably have held a grudge. When that sharing takes place, eyes are opened, bridges are built, the stranger becomes again a friend. Others shared similar insights from their own lives, seeing the places where it was important to welcome the stranger as a friend, to hold out a hand in reconciliation and peace, and as the reflection on the biblical story drew to a close, Louisa went to the centre of the room and without any self-consciousness, she broke the bread roll and passed it to the next person and so on the bread went around the group. It was an extraordinarily powerful moment. We were sharing communion. We were sharing the Mass. We were sharing the Lord's Supper in the breaking of bread. And this was a simple woman peasant who was doing this in the presence of a priest and a Protestant minister who received the same bread as a gift from her and from the group with Eucharistic joy. Eyes were well and truly opened to the grace of God, though they were filled also with tears as strangers became friends. I said that this Bible study was preparation for the Mass the following Sunday. The priest would include in the homily he gave the insights of the participants. Their experience of how the Gospel story interacts with and challenges life had a spirit-filled power which no amount of learning and academic study of the text could ever have imparted. As a lecturer in New Testament studies, I had access to many, many commentaries on the text on the shelves of my bookcase at home. I could read and analyse the Greek text, but I found that my insights were barren in comparison with these folks' deep understanding of what the Gospel message is all about. Where the Gospel meets our experience and we listen, real change begins in our own lives and in the communities where we struggle for justice, peace, and reconciliation. At the heart of the Christian story 
lies a message of hope emerging from the awful tragedy of human violence, betrayal and total breakdown of trust. The hope that grows from this otherwise depressing and hopeless tale is realistic. It is not blind hope. It's not naive hope. It's not based on a Pollyanna spirit that believes everything will work out well, whatever. It is a hope grounded in the discovery that God is reaching out a hand to us in the midst of betrayal and failure, in the midst of the inability to get things right on our own. It is God in Christ who makes us who are strangers friends, who brings hope into brokenness by taking the risk of self-giving, not the road of self-righteousness. The Jesus of the Emmaus Road does not need to be convinced that the stranger is of worth, including and perhaps especially today's migrant worker or asylum seeker. Like Louisa in the bakery, around us are neighbours, neighbours who need to share our bread. At the moment they may be strangers, but as bread is shared and broken, they become friends. In that moment, our eyes are open to see Christ in the stranger. The Jesus who journeys the Emmaus Road and opens the eyes of the confused and downcast asks us to follow in his footsteps, to befriend the stranger, to share all that we have and all that we are. Dare we, like Jesus, be countercultural? Dare we hold out our hand to our neighbours? and let strangers become friends. Amen. We sing together the doxology as our uh, offering is brought forward. <coughs> O oh, breath of life comes sweeping through us.
come now to our prayers of thanksgiving and prayers for others, and we're going to use a sung response as part of that. The words of the response are on the um, screens. Lord Jesus Christ, lover of all, trail wide the hem of your garment, bring healing, bring peace. You'll perhaps recognise that phrase as coming from the story of Jesus passing through the crowd and the woman who touched the hem of his garment as he passed and was healed. Um, so we'll, the choir and I will sing uh, this once through and then we'll try it together uh, and then we'll use it during the prayers. So this is what it sounds like. <laughs> sing, then you'll hear a note and we'll sing that together in response. Thank you. God of life and of all things living, we give thanks for your unrestricted kindness, which gives us hope in the face of death, courage in the face of our fears, light in the darkness of despair. So bless us as we sing. Remember that you welcome children and bless them. So we pray for children in our world who experience no such welcome, the victims of abusive parents, those who have been pressed into the violence of adult wars, those robbed of childhood by the relentless drive of human hatred and greed. Make us people of welcome, O oh God, as we sing. Lord Jesus Christ, lover of all, trail wide the hem of your garment, bring healing, bring peace. We remember that you were moved to tears by the needs of others, so we pray for victims of injustice and prejudice, those taunted, despised, or slandered simply because of the colour of their skin, their ethnic background, or their social standing, robbed of dignity by our incapability to celebrate difference. Make us people of welcome as we sing. Remember that you restored to health those who were sick. So we pray for loved ones who are ill at this time, for those in pain, for those without hope of recovery, for those distressed in mind, for those held prisoner by unseen chains of hopelessness, for those who grieve and for those who cannot let go robbed of peace and longing for your presence. Make us carer for others as we sing.
as we offer all of ourselves and our gifts in your name. Amen. Amen. We say together in whichever version we're most familiar, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us on the time of trial from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 436, Christ Triumphant, Ever Reigning. We stand to sing. go out in peace to serve God in the world and the blessing of God creator Christ and spirit be upon us both now and forevermore <laughs>